Bitcoin is the first perfected digital monetary network in the history of the world. It doesn't lose energy over time or space. It reflects the laws, it, it, it respects the laws of thermodynamics. It's never been done before. It's dominating everything that competes with it, right? There's no reason to believe it won't be 10 times bigger than 100 times bigger than 1,000 times bigger. Yeah. And it's just, it, it's hard to see how you stop it. This is a Bitcoin Audible chat with Michael Saylor. I just want to officially welcome Michael Saylor to the show, CEO of MicroStrategy, and uh, in very short order, uh, probably the most famous person in Bitcoin. <laughs> well, thank you, Guy. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Very nice of you. Um, so uh, you have made... Uh, some pretty serious waves recently um, for uh, buying up somewhere near point, somewhere between 0.1 and 0.2% of uh, all uh, future Bitcoin supply and uh, making a hell of a bold move into uh, a just serious conviction into seeing kind of the next steps in the future with uh, your company, MicroStrategy, that you've made Bitcoin the dominant treasury reserve. Now, before we get into all the dynamics of that and how you made that decision, I kind of want to just, for any of the audience that doesn't know, what is MicroStrategy and kind of give us the, in a nutshell, version of how you found yourself here. MicroStrategy is, we're a publicly traded company. We're the largest publicly traded business intelligence company in the world, at least independent one. So okay. we're a pure play. We, we sell enterprise software to large corporations and governments, banks, airlines, agencies, um, finance companies, retailers that want to uh, build sophisticated analytical applications on top of their own internal proprietary databases. We got into this business way back in the early 90s. Yeah, the idea was to extract you know, everything that McDonald's sold this week versus a year ago this week and calculate the, the uplift and the effective marketing and, and market basket analysis. And then eventually it became credit risk analysis. And every major enterprise has got some sophisticated application they need to build on top of their data. We provide a platform of tools to them. And uh, we've been doing it now for 31 years. So that's what we do. Nice. Okay. So when you talked about, uh, uh, like, when did you, you kind of fell into micro strategy? You talked about this on Pomp's podcast in the interview. Um, I where started that when I was 24. In, in when? When I, was, when I was 24. When you were 24. Um, how did... Was this something that like kind of you, you said something about like it just kind of fell into your lap, like like micro strategy just seemed to work? Yeah. Um, so the short of it is I wasn't trying to start a company. Right. When I was in high school, I was trying to be a rock star. When I was in college, I was trying to be an astronaut. You know, I got a degree in aeronautics and astronautics. I learned to fly in the Air Force. You know, I was all ready to go. I had my route from from fighter pilot to test pilot to astronaut all mapped out. Oh, wow. Um, that, that didn't work out. Uh, <laughs> it didn't work out because a doctor diagnosed me with a benign heart murmur and he was wrong. 10 years later, it turned out I didn't have one. But no I got, kidding. I got a misdiagnosis in my senior year at MIT that disqualified me from flying jets. He just made a mistake. Um, That's and, crazy. Uh, but I did not, my hopes were dashed and my life was ruined. And I did not know that I did not have a heart murmur until 10 years later when I had already started micro strategy and it became largely irrelevant for me. Yeah. But uh, that was my second thing. My third thing was, so I, I was uh, gonna go get a PhD and uh, political economy. And I wanted, to, uh, you know, I wanted to uh, be a professor, write books, teach people stuff, learn stuff. And uh, when I tended my resignation for, to the DuPont Corporation at the age of like 23 and a half, or whatever, I was all ready to go. I 
you know, I would have gone being a professor straight out of uh, MIT. I didn't have any money and I needed a fellowship. And because I got bounced out of the Air Force in the last few months of, uh, of my last semester, I missed the, uh, the filing deadlines for all the fellowships. So, so I figure I'll go work for a year, I'll work for two years. So I tendered my resignation. They didn't want me to quit because I was building a computer simulation that was used to assess the profitability of a multi-billion dollar capital investment in petrochemicals. Okay. So uh, the guy I'm working for is going to get a billion or a billion and a half dollars from his board of directors if the model looks good. And I was the kid that knew how to make the computer model work. And I was the only kid on the Eastern, but in the world at the time that could make it work in time for his board meeting so he could get the money. That's so a responsibility. <laughs> I'm inadvertently standing in between a dude and a billion dollars at age 24. And what am I? I'm a nobody. But I'm a nobody. I quit. The guy sees his billion dollars floating away. He says to his staffers, go give the kid whatever he wants. Well, we can't have him quit before we get the billion dollars. So they said, you want to raise? No. You want, what do you want? You want a new computer? No. You want a bigger <laughs> office? No. Like, you know, what, what do you want? You want more power at DuPont? I'm like, no, I'm not a chemical engineer. I'm never going to be the CEO of DuPont. The only thing I want, other than being a rock star, astronaut, or professor, is the last thing on my checklist was be CEO of your own company. So I said, if you guys let me start my own company, you got to give me the money, give me the office space, give me the people, <laughs> and I'll do this thing for you. And so MicroStrategy kind of was started that way. And I always thought, well, I'll do it until it fails, and then I'll go back to college and get that PhD. Uh, you know, and it didn't fail. It kept doubling and doubling and doubling. And eventually it was too late to go back to school. So I was stuck in my current role 31 <laughs> years later. Wow. 30, 31 years of success. And there you go. Um, I still want to be a professor, by the way. Really? What In what? I, I guess it'd be, it, it would be 21st century digital economics. <laughs> 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 oh, that's, that's a, see, see right there. That that's like, that is, that is what my show is. That is digital economics. That is a, that is a much better way to describe, um, uh, kind of how all this comes together in Bitcoin. Have you always do you love what you do? Do what? Do you not love what you do? Oh yeah. I couldn't, I started it for, you know, for free. Like I was just doing it. And then like, I couldn't like anytime I tried to divert and like go do something else because somebody was like openly being like, I'll pay you for this. Like I just got, I'm, I was so sick of it immediately. And I just spent my whole time talking, thinking about <laughs> Bitcoin and what was going to happen and listening to books and stuff, just like, just like the mobile wave, even though I actually, uh, I'm actually really happy that all of this happened because I probably wouldn't have bumped into the mobile wave early, uh, outside of that, your, your book, by the way, for the yeah. audience. And guy, I wouldn't have bumped into you or the entire Bitcoin community. So, <laughs> so it's kind of funny how things work. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would change places with you if I couldn't do my job. I think you have a you have a fun job. Dude, I I totally agree. I agree absolutely. I love what I do. Um, have you always been kind of a techie, like like just kind of like fascinated with like how the internet grew up like in the nineties and stuff. Like, did you kind of see the writing on the wall then as well? I'm, I'm like a red butted American male. I, I grew up on air force bases. I discovered, I discovered books in first grade. I was a big fan of Robert Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac oh, yeah. Asimov by third grade. And you know, third grade, you know, I'm in a, I, I'm chatting with some, doctor because i have the flu and the doctor and i are both talking about robert heinlein and time enough for love and my mother's watching the two of us go back and forth and we get to some <laughs> section where we can't talk about with my mother in the room and that was that <laughs> uh, no i was you know i i was a big fan of all of that and i wanted to i always was fascinated by technology when i went to mit I got a degree in astronautical engineering and space systems, but I also um, got another degree in 
the history of science. And, uh, and that was kind of, it was interdisciplinary humanities, but I studied the structure of scientific revolutions, the introduction of electricity, the introduction of nuclear energy, the introduction of antibiotics, the, intro, the impact of railroads, network effects. And I was just fascinated by that stuff back in the, in the mid eighties. And I always was fascinated by the history of technology or, or you should say the way in which paradigm shifts take place. How is yeah. it that people react to a brand new idea? And what is the impact on the civilization, the society, the economy, once that idea takes hold? Yeah, dude, that, that is absolutely one of my, one of the most famous, the uh, fascinating things to me to like go back and read about. I hadn't thought about antibiotics though. That's something I got to find. Is there like a good book on that one? Because I don't think I know anything about the history of that. Well, I, you know, I don't know if there's a good book, but I just make the point, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a rich Roman in the time of the Antonines, maybe the first, second century AD, could live to age 72. And Augustus Caesar lived to about that age. Mm -hmm. Then we plunge into the Dark Ages and, uh, and we, lose the, we lose sanitation, the aqueducts break down, people forget that they need to, you know, run... Run, running water through cities all <laughs> off waste, and the average life expectancy shrinks to 30, 31. Ooh. Then, um, you know, you, go, you fast forward the American Revolution, the average life expectancy of an of a, of a American patriot is like 33, 34, you know? Then um, you get to Bismarck, <clears throat> 1870, Germany, and Bismarck introduces Social Security that pays off at 65 years, but the average life expectancy of a German was mid-40s. <laughs> they weren't expected to live there. <laughs> in 1900, the turn of the century, average life expectancy of an American is 50. Okay, 50, the good old days. And then in 1950, it goes to 70. Okay, so the massive change in the civilization, it, it was... It took that long to get back to the life expectancy of a rich Roman. And wow. the number one reason why was the conquest of infectious disease. And we did that probably with the, the combination of the understanding of sterilization, mm -hmm. right? And then antibiotics. Those are the two things that happened. So probably those are the two most monumental things. And antibiotics may in fact, penicillin may in fact be the most significant technology invention in the history of humanity because single-handedly it drove life expectancy up by 20 years that one wow. that one idea and so if you if you just dig into history of penicillin you'll probably find some interesting stuff all right that's <laughs> it's funny how like when you when you start looking back how young or how recent just the idea of like hygiene is you know like it just, you don't have to go far back to realize how much has changed in like the last hundred years. Um, uh, one of my, one of my favorite, you talk about like paradigm shifts and stuff, uh, a book that just, just had me from start to finish. And one of the most fascinating stories in my, in my opinion is ACDC. Um, the, just the electricity standards and the, the entire, like that whole period where electricity was being, sold to the public and like you say how people reacted to it and uh what ended up being the thing that took uh ac uh as the dominant the top dominant force and stuff like that that whole story is just one of the most insane tales of history uh to me yeah it is fascinating the struggle between direct current and alternating current and People forget that once upon a time, electricity was a technology company, you know, general yeah. electric, technology company, Westinghouse. Yeah, I think electricity is a fascinating metaphor, too. I mean, I'll make two points. One, all the, all the history in the 20th century, all of the millions of pages of, of history written is all about politics and, and, and war and, and uh, entertainment and it's colorful and gossipy. But probably if you took one paragraph, the paragraph that describes the invention of penicillin, that's probably more important and more consequential to, to human prosperity or misery than everything else you could read 
<laughs> so, you know, the historians tend to get hijacked by stuff that is not important and the stuff that's really important, the fact that you're not going to die 20 years earlier, that could be boiled down to like two paragraphs that most people overlook. Yeah. And so that, that's one observation. The second is with regard to hist with electricity, I think electricity is fascinating because you could metaphorically describe Bitcoin as simply a monetary energy network or in fact it's the first closed energy system to transmit energy across time and space that doesn't suffer from loss line loss or from battery drainage it's a battery plus a network yeah. so if you look at if you look at uh, most power systems you lose two to six percent of the power from the station to your home and you can't move electricity more than about a thousand miles and practically speaking 500 miles so taking electricity from the east coast of the united states to tokyo th the loss of energy would be obscene because you have to convert it into like you probably got to put it as crude oil in a tanker you know float it yeah. around the world and then take it out and burn it yeah okay, so you're probably talking about 20 30 40 percent energy loss to do that and on the other hand energy eventually flows into a battery and in the mobile wave, I write that, you know, lithium ion batteries are critical to mobile devices. No batteries, no mobile devices, no mobile wave, right? Yeah. It's a critical element. When you put electricity into a battery, you're generally losing 2% of the power per month. Kind of interesting, 24% a year brain drain or, or electric power drain. You know, it sounds kind of like 24% a year negative real yield. Yeah. If you, put, you know, yeah. if you put your money into uh, into a, a currency that's being inflated, yeah, you know, I could make an argument that um, that uh, long bond assets, you know, had uh, an inflation rate of twenty two percent this year so far. They're up twenty two. You know, in other uh -huh. words, the Fed is printing money. And those bonds spike 22%. So if you were holding cash and wanted to convert, you lost 22% of your money or 22% drain. So if you look at gold, if you compared a battery of Bitcoin and a battery of gold, and I put all of my money into Bitcoin, I put $100 million into Bitcoin, there's effectively no dilution once you, if you calculate the fully diluted Bitcoin count from here to infinity, you're gonna have 21 million Bitcoin. So yeah. I know that the worst yeah. case is there's 15% dilution over 150 years, right? Worst case, but the logical case is there's no, That's there's not so no bad. dilution. It's a completely closed system. Yeah. On the other hand, I put all my money into gold. The best case is 2% a year. They're going to print more. They're going to mine more gold 2% a year. That means over a hundred years, you're going to lose 85% of your energy. You know, you, you get cut in half every 35 years at 2%, which means that you're down to like 12.5% in 100 years. Gold as a battery is draining energy at least 2% a year. But more reasonably speaking, if you consider that the price of gold goes up, miners invest more capital in order to produce more gold. Uh, as time goes by, human beings get smarter. They invent stuff. And like fracking. You remember fracking? Remember when yeah. we had a, a, an oil crisis in this country because we didn't have enough crude oil and then all of a sudden the price of oil went up enough that we doubled the amount of crude oil we produced every day and then we mm -hmm. didn't have any oil limits anymore yeah. well so over a hundred years you can expect that people will invent the equivalent of fracking for gold if it goes up in price if it doesn't go in, up in price you lose if it goes up <laughs> in price they'll come up with a new technique to create it you know, and there's always the maybe we tap into an asteroid or maybe we mine the oceans or maybe, maybe people that buy gold realize that they ought to just flip it to digital gold and then all the demand for gold goes away and then you're screwed. Yeah. So back to electricity. Bitcoin is really just a power network to move energy across time and space. I could put, I, I, I can take a hundred million dollars converted into, well, a hundred million dollars of energy converted mm -hmm. into a hundred million dollars of fiat convert it to $100 million of Bitcoin and send it forward 100 years with no drainage or power loss. It's a battery that doesn't drain. I can take the same amount of energy. I can take my energy, convert it to fiat, convert it to Bitcoin, send that $100 million of Bitcoin to Tokyo in 30 minutes. 
and maybe I pay five bucks. Okay, you can't move a hundred million dollars of energy for five dollars to Tokyo. So what you've got is an energy network where the battery never drains over time and where there is no transmission limit or cost over space. And that is revolutionary. And I don't think people that understand they're looking at gold or looking at any other treasury asset. I don't think they understand that this is a closed energy network that respects the first law of thermodynamics or it's an, it's a Newtonian network. I take a pendulum, mm -hmm. you know, and it converts kinetic energy to potential energy. Mm -hmm. And in the absence of friction, it will do this forever. Right. That's, that's what the first closed system you learn in freshman physics in college. Yeah. That's Bitcoin. That's not gold. Gold's got friction. 2%, 3% a year is friction. It runs down. You know, yeah. fiat, 7, 8% a year. You put $100 million of energy into fiat, wait 100 years, you've got less than 1% of your energy left. It's yeah. a battery that's draining. That's if years. history repeats itself, but it looks like that's going to accelerate. That might only take 10, 20 years this time around. <laughs> yeah, I, look, I was oblivious to this guy. I mean, I wasn't really paying attention until I got hit over the head with this crisis. And then I started paying attention. And then I realized, and then I read, I read Saifedean's book, you know, yeah. the Bitcoin standard. And I'm like, oh my, under a good year for the past decade, the monetary supply expands by seven to eight percent. That's yeah. my battery draining by eight percent a year. That's yeah. a good year. And this is not a good year for us, right? This is a year where you can make the argument that the battery is going to drain 25 percent. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, potentially even more. Like if you uh, have you ever heard of the Chapwood index? I, I didn't until just a, about a month ago. Okay. And then I did. And I, I, I looked at it with horrifying awe. <laughs> it's like, and and it, it all of a sudden turned my worldview upside down. And I, what I realized, you know, and I think nobody thinks about this. Look, there's an old quote, you know, we learned in all of our studies of propaganda and marketing, we learned that we can't tell people what to think, but we can tell them what to think about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the world thinks about inflation. We tell them to think about inflation and we point them towards CPI. But the truth is <clears throat> the big, the big misconception is that inflation is a scalar and that scalar equals CPI. <clears throat> and that the methodology for calculating inflation is to collect the market basket of consumer goods you know, that is cherry picked and calculate CPI. But in fact, uh, a more sophisticated understanding is inflation is a vector. You know, inflation is, is uh, taking place at a different rate across different goods and services. So, for yeah. example, yeah. the inflation rate of real estate on, on bordering on Central Park mm -hmm. for the past 30 years is not the CPI. Anybody that, you know, anybody that owns New York real estate knows that it went up faster. The inflation rate of beachfront real estate in South Florida is not the CPI. Yeah. 10 years ago, you could have bought a bond for a million dollars that gave you $50,000 a year in income. Today, that same bond would cost you $10 million. And so the inflation rate on an annuity, on an asset that yields an annuity, is a, it's a thousand percent over 10 years. So what is that per year, right? Let's kind of try to figure that out, right? You're yeah. talking about 35% a year or I mean, some astronomical amount. And now, now we've got this little, it's kind of like an offensive patronizing, uh, patronizing uh, narrative. You know, guy, you're a consumer. You know, we're gonna keep track of the cost of bread and candy bars and Domino's pizza. And we're yeah. gonna make sure that it doesn't go up more than 2% for you. Because that's all you want. All you want is Netflix and YouTube streaming and Domino's pizza. And, and we're going to make sure that doesn't get too expensive for you, guy. And on the other end, if guy, if you wanted to buy an annuity so you'd never have to work again the rest of your life, that's not for you. you know, that's Don't think for about that. That's, you wouldn't want to not work not the rest of your life. That's not inflation. The fact that your annuity, your bond went up by 30% a year every year for 10 
stinking years. And now you have to work the rest of, you have to work a thousand years in order to be able to afford a bond that gives you $50,000 a year at income. Don't worry about, don't worry your pretty little head about that. That is not inflation. I mean, that's asset inflation. That's not in the CPI. But, you know, I, I jokingly say, like, we have no inflation in this stuff manufactured by robots and factories and AIs in cyberspace. You have inflation on everything you want. Yeah. yeah. Right? What I want is I want an acre of beachfront property in South Florida. Yeah. What I want is a beautiful condominium. You know, what I want is to not have to work again the rest of my life. What I want is a Harvard education or Ivy League of education for my son or daughter, right? That's yeah. what I want. That stuff has been going up in a good year, seven to eight percent. Yeah. But you know, it's horrifying to do the calculation of what is the inflation rate of a of a 10-year bond that actually that you can buy and use to not work or retire on because it, you know, I remember a guy when you could actually put your money in overnight. Um, this is 10 years ago. Overnight, like repo market funds, and you get paid 550 basis points. Overnight? So million, yeah, like zero duration, short-term money. Wow. 500, 5.5% interest. I used to do it corporately. So $10 million yields $500,000 in income. You know? Uh, and uh, and a million dollars gives you fifty five thousand dollars a year. You can retire on that, like normal person, yeah. very well. Save their pennies and retire on that. You know, you care to ask me what that rate is today? <laughs> yes, actually, what is the rate? <laughs> I, I, I think like it went from five hundred and fifty basis points to seventeen mm. basis points. I'm surprised you can get positive. <laughs> you know, maybe you can get, maybe you can get 15, like we're talking about for, you know, we're talking about 15 one hundredths of 1%. So another way to say it, by the way, is that that bond went from costing a million dollars to costing $25 million guy in 10 years. That's but there's no inflation. No inflation. These are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> There's no inflation. By the way, not only is there no inflation, your bond, your your light, your retirement cost went from a million dollars to twenty five million. Even though there's no inflation, it's worse than that. We can't find inflation. We have to print more money to find inflation. Yeah. You know, they're not going to get it. Because the cost of YouTube and Netflix is not going up, no matter how much money gets printed, mm -hmm. they're going to get inflation in the assets. You know, so back to this issue, inflation's a vector. And if you stack up a list of 100 things you want, there's 20 of them that aren't going to have an inflation. And the other 80 are going to have some inflation. And you can cherry pick any market basket of, of, that, metric, of that vector and make that your scaler and call that the CPI. And you can manufacture an arbitrarily low one, and then you can say, I, I'm just kind of shocked that anybody thinks there's a problem. And of course, the answer is, you know, you're not going to be able to retire on a, on a fixed income annuity. And so therefore, you got to go buy equity. But in, in what way, shape, or form is that fair to, like, my, I'm going to tell my father, a retired chief master sergeant in the Air Force, that he's got to go become a qualified equity analyst and pick his stocks at age 82 in order to be yeah. able to not starve to death that's one of the most ridiculous things to me is the the sheer idea that we're going to force everyone in in some effort to make the economy like more active we're going to basically bleed everybody dry of the one asset that they can actually hold uh, independently of, of like cash, the thing that they worked for, like they already produced value into the economy. That's why they have money because they traded with someone and then they're going to bleed that dry so that somebody has to figure out how the, how the hell they just have a whole second job to figure out how to analyze stocks and bonds and all of these other things that they now have to put their money into for no reason when it's it's like destroying the specialization of uh, the economy, a specialization of labor. 
like you're supposed to be able to learn one thing and then hold money like to to actually trade with the rest of the economy it's just it's insane it's a it's a trap what should be happening is that banks should be giving you 5% or more interest on your savings account risk free yeah and, and if you wanted to buy a bond that locks you up for 5 or 10 or 20 years you should be able to get it for seven or eight from the government. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to take risk on a corporation, you should be getting 11, 12% for that risk. And then if you want something better, you should go into equity. That's, that's the way the world ought to be. If, if the free market was left to its own devices, yeah. that's how it would find itself. It's just, there's just, well, if we had real money, that would be, you, you would actually have to pay the price for capital. Um, like there'd be a real, there'd be a pushback. If you ever loaned out more than people could actually afford, you'd go out of business. Like you'd, you'd put yourself at huge risk. And when the bill came due and you had to withdraw the sound money, you wouldn't be able to fill the bill. You wouldn't be able to, the check would bounce. Um, but we just don't have that. Um, and that, I kind of want to ask, yeah, I want to ask about like, how does Bitcoin fit into this? What is in your mind? I mean, I'll, I'll say it seems it's crazy to me how quickly you seem to have gone down the rabbit hole here. Like this all happened this year, right? Like you oh, just kind of hit this with COVID. This all happened this year. Okay. How many people used Zoom on January 1st of this year? You, <laughs> that's okay, a big how, question and how many use it today right i mean I, we went from 10 million users to 350 or 400 million users i i'm not the only guy that got sent down a rabbit hole yeah. but a lot of people got sent down a rabbit hole in different areas um here's my thinking on this um we've got a crisis of confidence um in in uh status quo assets and uh and that has been building ever since the great you know financial crisis 10 years ago people that are macro economists and very sensitive to this and the bitcoiners they were very sensitive they got it earlier yeah. right and uh and the rank and file were living kind of uh uh kind of living in a comfort zone because tech stocks are going up and the rest of the economy is going up and taxes are going down and interest are gradually going down. So no one else has got a crisis. And then, and then in March of this year, we have the pandemic and it just causes a rethinking of everything. So what we, what we got was a V-shaped recovery in asset values and we got uh, no V-shaped recovery in Main Street and in the real economy. Yeah. And when that happened, uh, people like me that like to think that the world is rational, you know, and, and, and uh, maybe fear. Like, I, I would tell you, if you were to come to me and say, Mike, you can buy this bond, it yields 2% interest for the next, and you're going to lock up your money for the next 30 years, and you're going to get 2% interest, you know? I, I, I would have said to you on January 1st, I would have said, I don't think that makes any sense to, to like get paid 2%. You're, let me get this right. You're telling me that if I give you everything that I own, you will give me back 2% of what I own each year or, and you will keep, you'll keep everything I own. And at the end of my lifetime, you'll give me back 20% of what I used to own. Okay. Paul, right, think that through, right? You're telling me you, that I'm going to give you everything that I own and you're going to give me back well, 20, 25% of it at the end of my life when I'm dead. I'm like, no, thank you. I, yeah. I just don't get it. So I wouldn't have taken that trade. Mm -hmm. that, uh, but guy, that trade is the long bond trade. And then after the COVID crisis and after the Fed started doing what they did, the long bond index went up 22%. So if you had actually invested your all your money in that proposition, you would have gotten a 22% return this year. If you and to me that's a moral hazard. Yeah. Oh that's yeah. A, because because the only way you make money like 
giving, you give up your entire life forever in return for what's an awful proposition. And then you, and Guy, you say to me, well, don't worry, Mike, we're going to lobby the Fed to lower the interest rates. And that 2% bond is going to trade down to 1.2%. And then, or, or the interest rate is going to trade down to 1.2%. And therefore the bond is going to have to trade up 30 times the difference. And so you're going to get 30 times 1% or, or 30 times 0.8%. And that's where your 22% gain comes. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get it all in a hurry. You know, a, a lot of people much more sophisticated than me took that trade and they made that money. But there's just, there's just something unseemly about the idea that I have to give up everything that I own for the rest of my life in return for 25% of it back after I'm dead. And then I'm going to trust the, the central bankers to actually make me money and make me whole now, right? That, yeah. That's socialized investment. Yeah. So that's it's what cool. happened this year. Go ahead. Um, it's, it's, it's hilarious. Like, like I always try to, because money is such, a, is, is something that so often confuses the dynamic of what's actually happening um, because people think of money as some unique thing. Uh, it's, it's always funny to go back and look at like what's actually happening with the real resources. So imagine rather than that being like, you know, $50,000 in savings, it's a $50,000 car, is that it's, it's like a deal that says, look, I'm going to use your car for the next five years, and you're only going to have to pay me $300 a year to do it. <laughs> you know, like, like, rather than paying you rent on the car, you're just only going to lose a small amount, you're only gonna have to pay me a little bit for taking your car and driving it around everywhere. <laughs> And it's even worse than that because it's like, I'm going to take your car, drive it around. You're going to pay me money, but don't worry because in three months we're going to change the car interest rate to double negative, And then we're going to give you back the value of your car <laughs> when you trade it to the next sucker that takes the, that you're, you're going to trade your, you just have to dump it to somebody else. That's right. We're going to charge you $300 to drive your, your car, but we're going to start charging other people $600 to, to drive their car and they're going to buy your $300 negative car from you so that they don't oh. have to pay $600. You know, it, you know it's, it's so absurd. Painful. So now coming back to, to Bitcoin. So you see that and, and what happens is the person holding cash, like I'm holding cash and I didn't get the 22% capital gain. Because I didn't take the 2% for the rest of my life. Like I didn't take the bad value proposition, but I get screwed. Okay. Yeah. So now you start to realize that bonds trade up through the roof. Interest rates go to zero, right? Yeah. You could buy bonds and Wall Street's buying bonds, hoping they'll go below zero because that's the only way you make money on bonds. Yeah. The equity market goes to an all-time high. Big tech becomes the most crowded trade. You know, you have this bizarre distortion in the real estate market where, where uh, you know, you've got all these real estate assets and a lot of them are impaired. And so half of the real estate assets, no one's going to want going forward. And the other half are overpriced. So you can't really buy real estate. And then all of the short, you know, municipal bonds are going through the roof, even though the credit risk on municipals is also going through the roof. It's, nothing's making any sense. So the question is, I've got a bunch of cash. The negative real yield on cash looks to be minus 10 to minus 20%. I, you could make an argument that the negative real yield on cash this year is minus 20 to minus 25%. If you took that long bond index of 22%, take you know bonds inflated by 22%, therefore you're getting zero on your cash, therefore your negative real yield is 22%. Yeah. And, and I so fully expect it to be in like kind of the 20% range of any of any serious like measurement, um, you know, with technology and stuff, you get the massive benefit, like you talk about with like a net Netflix subscription, you get the massive benefit of the deflationary effects of technology, that those costs are always coming down because it's getting more efficient and better and storage and CPU, all that stuff. Um, but those real assets like real estate, uh, bonds, like all that stuff, like I fully expect it to be kind of a 20% range. When's the last time an economist decided to put a Picasso painting 
or a sweet penthouse in New York City or a Hamptons house <laughs> or an Ivy League education or, or a bond that lets you retire for the rest of your life. When do they put that into a market basket? Yeah. They're, ne yeah. they're never going to put anything cool or a yacht or a jet or, you know, <laughs> they're never going to put anything cool that you would strive for into that market basket. So they're always going to duck that. But, uh, you know, so if real, we could debate what it is, who knows what it is, but minus 20% on, it. you got a 20% ash inflation rate this year, and maybe you'll get a 10% every year for the next decade. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could easily, and you could get worse, right? I mean, you mm -hmm. could, but, but if you were getting 7% real inflation in the last decade, the logical forecast is it's more in the next decade, right? It could be double. Oh, yeah. Let's yeah. say it's double. So you're looking at 15% negative real yield on cash for the next 10 years. You know, the rule of 70 says that it gets cut in half, right? Every four years. That means you're going to have about 20% of your money at the end of the decade if you're sitting on cash, if that. So how so hard was this sell to everybody at MicroStrategy? How hard was it to kind of go through this whole rabbit hole? With every was everybody kind of on the same page? Or was this kind of a big, like, argue with each other and take our own routes? <laughs> well, I mean, the good news this year, and this is the interesting thing that happened, Guy, the, the conventional talking heads and the conventional investment advisors, they don't understand Bitcoin and they can't sell you Bitcoin, but they do understand inflation and they do understand that when the Fed prints money and then stocks go through the roof and bonds go through the roof while Main Street shuts down, yeah, they do yeah. understand that this is inflationary. And so their prescription to everybody, you know, if you're if you're a, a retired, you know, investor, Merrill Lynch is going to tell you, you should put 25% of your portfolio into gold. So, so they're all coming to, you should go to, you should put it into tangible assets that are inflation hedges. You know, for a while they said, buy big tech. That's great. The buy big tech 10 years after it was an obvious good idea to buy big tech, <laughs> right? That's what happened this year, you know? Um, for a while they said that, but now if you look at a JP Morgan, a Morgan, a, a Morgan Stanley, a Bank of America, Citigroup, all the big mega wealth advisors, they're all going to say up your portion of your portfolio in precious metals or other mm -hmm. inflation hedges. So the traditional things, yeah. You have to be living under a rock yeah. to not have heard that, right? Yeah. So then the discussion just becomes. <clears throat> at the board level, hey guys, we have a lot of cash. What are we gonna put it in? Do you wanna buy, do you wanna buy Apple stock at the all time high or Amazon stock at the all time high? Do you wanna buy a, 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 a mixture of the S&P 500? Do you wanna buy a portfolio of commercial real estate? Well, you know, you can't buy a portfolio of stocks when it's a crowded trade at the all time high and, and, and equity risk is huge. You know, you, I could talk about why that's a risky thing, but we'll, we'll jump on to real estate. You can't buy a market basket portfolio of commercial real estate right now. Just can't practically do it. At a, who's going to sell you real estate at a good value this year, yeah. right? Um, you're, you're getting a double whammy because, of course, the cap rates are, are insane because the interest rate's gone through the floor. So it's, it's double inflated. So you're down to precious metals or Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. So mm -hmm. it really becomes the, is it silver, is it gold, or is it Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. And so when you work through that, you know, you have to parse through all the other cryptos, but, but uh, the fundamental observation is Bitcoin is the dominant crypto. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think the, the dominance number that's printed by the media in crypto is right. They talk about Bitcoin being 60% of crypto. That's kind of good if the goal is to get a lot of people to buy a lot of altcoins and, and yeah. <laughs> that. But the truth of the matter is, if you look at real Bitcoin dominance, crypt, uh, Bitcoin is 92%, and then Bitcoin Cash is 2%, and the next one is one and a quarter percent, and the next one is less than 1%. And anybody with half a brain can just stack up the top 20, 10 proof of work decentralized crypto networks to purport to be a store of value, right? And, and fundamentally, you just got to get to the idea it's a store of value. Some people just don't get it. They think that 
we need to be able to pay for our coffee and crypto. We, we need, <laughs> you don't, like, yeah. you just don't. Like you can use Apple Pay and Square Cash and PayPal. There's nobody in the universe walking around worrying that the Fed is going to take their $5 from their coffee and make it $4 for their coffee. That's yeah. not what keeps you up at night. We're worried about losing everything. Yeah. That's <laughs> not a multi-trillion dollar problem. That's like, that's the one thing that you can count on that nobody really cares about a $2 purchase, you know? Like, go back uh, 50 years. It's the savings account versus the checking account. Yeah. Yeah. Like maybe if you grew up in the seventies or eighties or whatever, you had a savings account, you had a checking account, you put most of your money in your savings account and you got 6% interest. And then you put a small amount of money in your checking account and you got no interest. And that worked fine for people. So, so uh, if you look at the crypto networks that are savings accounts, yeah. that, that are going to keep, they're going to protect your life force for the next hundred years. It's got to be a proof of work network that's decentralized with a massive hash rate. 92% is Bitcoin. By the way, like, if you look at every other technology network, go back and look at Apple, go, you know, in 2010, you know, look at Google, look at YouTube, look at Facebook, look at Instagram, you know, look at uh, Amazon. This is not a complicated problem. You can see it in my book, The Mobile Wave. It was very obvious. Mm -hmm. Find a digital network that's dematerializing products and services. It's, it's dematerializing them on a network. When it's $100 billion in market cap, it's probably one. If yeah. it's 10 times bigger than the next thing, you know, when you were looking at like iOS versus Android versus BlackBerry. Yeah. Okay. You know, they were like, well, I think Android's going to beat iOS. It's like, I said, guys, 90% of the money is on iOS, right? 10% <laughs> of the money, 20% is on Android. And then everything else is going to zero, right? There's gonna be a big one. And then when you did the calculation, Apple was maybe 20% of the units of the iPhone. They were 150% of the profit of every mobile phone company. So like every, and this is what happened, That's crazy. right? The yeah. dominant player not only makes all the money, they make more than all the money. And, and when HP wants to launch their own mobile phone, or when IBM wants to launch their own mobile phone, or Yo-Yo Dine wants to get into it, it's just utterly impossible. And the answer, the, the reason why it's pretty obvious if you look at YouTube, or look at Twitter, or look at mm -hmm. Facebook, is like when 187 million people use the same thing, and when you can package a new, uh, a new thing and put it up on the network and, and ship it to a billion people overnight for a nickel, yeah. it's not likely anybody else is going to be able to compete with that economy of scale. You're manufacturing something to 100 million people in a day for, and shipping it for zero variable cost. Yeah. Never in the history of the world could someone ship a product or a service to a billion people for zero variable and, and not quite zero. You got cost of electricity, right? Yeah. 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 And you can ship it for the cost of electricity. Yeah. Right. You've got a dominant digital network. That thing at a hundred billion is going to go to a trillion. Yeah. It's going to, and then it's going to go to 2 trillion and then people are going to talk about it. And, but when it's a hundred billion conventional thinkers on wall street, they're going to say to you guy, they're going to say, well, you know, uh, if Apple goes up again, we're going to sell Apple and buy you some Dell and some HP and some IBM in order to diversify your computer interests. Huh. And then they're going to say, you know, when Amazon doesn't make any money, it doesn't make any money. We're going to buy you some Walmart or some, you know, a portfolio. Or then they're going to say, you know. Uh, Network uh, effects are, are a bitch. <laughs> you they're going to say, they're going to say, when 25% of your portfolio is technology, we're going to sell up to 5%. We're going to sell 20% of it. And we're going to put you into consumer cyclicals or some, you know, something else that's more dependable and, and electric utilities or something like that, you know? And what they don't realize is, number one, the dominant player, you know, is going to take everything. Yeah. Like everything. It's just, yeah. you know, 
and the, the network effects in Bitcoin and money are so much more potent even than something like social media and like, like just because like, you know, at least in like social media, you can have an account on Facebook and MySpace at the same time, but you can't hold the same, the same piece of value in both Bitcoin and an altcoin or both Bitcoin and fiat, you have to choose explicitly. And there's a huge trade-off. There's a huge risk in not choosing the one that's gonna be dominant or the one that is clearly dominant today. Bitcoin is the first perfected digital monetary network in the history of the world. It doesn't lose energy over time or space. It reflects the laws, it, it, it respects the laws of thermodynamics it's never been done before. It's dominating everything that competes with it, right? There's no reason to believe it won't be 10 times bigger than 100 times bigger than 1,000 times bigger. Yeah. And it's, just, it, it's hard to see how you stop it. Now, com coming back to this investment thesis, here's the big idea. Once you've got the dominant digital network, it's going to take everything in its space. Yeah. It's, going to, it's going to expand to be... 80, 90% of this market, there might be a 10% or something, but that's not going to make any money. It's just, it, it's not going to work. And it's going to take everything in a space, all of the free energy in the space. And it's just going to keep growing from that point of view. And no one's going to be able to attack it. Now, here's the other big idea. All these smart investors on Wall Street that tell you, you got too much technology. They're going to diversify your out of technology. Well, there really isn't any winning technology. There isn't any winning investment strategy other than technology. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the idea that only 25% of, of the marketplace is technology is a defective, ignorant idea, right? Every successful company in the modern, for the last hundred years, they were all technology companies when they were growing. They, when they stop growing, that means that their technology is not cutting edge anymore. And so Westinghouse was a technology company. GE was a technology company. G, you know, Standard Oil. If you read the history of John D. Rockefeller, he did everything that Jeff Bezos did 100 years earlier. Yeah. Like the entire playbook, you know, was John D. Rockefeller. Andrew Carnegie. You know, if you think you know how to create steel... Read, read American Steel about what it means to create a steel refinery. Yeah, that's you another one that up. just is so cool to me, like, like digging into the, some of that stuff. I don't think I've ever done an episode on the show about that one. That's probably another one to really dig into, the, the history of steel and how it just like cut like by 80% the cost of steel like everywhere. Just, oh my God, that whole story is fascinating. That, and that takes us to our next subject, which is, <clears throat> which is uh, the, it's the, the economic impact of an elemental material on an industry. Yeah. Bitcoin, Bitcoin is, is crypto gold. It's digital gold. It's at least a hundred times better than gold. I think it's probably thousands <laughs> of times better than gold. That's the story that no, that people are afraid to say they haven't really yeah. thought it through because they come at this from a point of view of, of, macroeconomists. So they know it's harder than gold, stock to flow, but, but, mm -hmm. but they undersell it. It's like, well, stock to flow just crossed over gold. Guys, that's not it. If you look at a hundred years, stock to flow is infinity for yeah, Bitcoin. It's, in, it's infinite. Yeah. It's infinite for Bitcoin. So infinity versus over the stock to flow of gold, it's a very high number. Right? <laughs> so, so yeah, it's better for that infinity reason. Infinity divided by anything is infinity. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't really got to the issue that's at, at hand, which is digital gold is smarter, faster, stronger than gold. Just yeah. in the same way that your YouTube podcast is smarter, faster, stronger than you getting invited to go on conventional network television late night or in yeah. prime time. Uh, it's, you know, it's, you want to actually ship a DVD with this show out to people that want to buy it and sell it through Walmart and Blockbuster? Or do you want to upload this to YouTube? It's not, it's, it's not like just slightly better. So crypto gold. Can I ask you, can I, can I ask yeah. you a question on that thread? Um, I don't want to get you off topic, but 
Um, with the mobile wave, you hit so many of the elements, like, like you kind of hit those, those core pieces of like, there's this revolution in battery technology. Um, there's a revolution in the interface. You talk a lot about like multi-touch and how like interacting with it was a huge player. And then you extrapolate all these things that are going to happen and kind of how we're going to change how we think about this stuff. And literally you could have just been writing a book so far. What I've gotten out of it is you could have just been describing what's going on today. And, you know, you wrote this about a decade ago. What do you see with Bitcoin? Well, like, like taking it out 10 years, what does Bitcoin change in those fundamentals that <clears throat> causes a shift in, and how uh, we interact and think about money? The, mo the mobile wave is all about how when a product goes from uh, – from material state with mass and uh, and friction to software, it dematerializes to software. It becomes magical, right? Uh, and uh, and I described all the magical things. And you're you're I mean, Zoom's magical. The camera, oh, yeah. the iPhone's yeah. magical. Instagram's magical. The things that we do today, the guys at Kodak couldn't conceive yeah. of. Right. Think about what we're doing right now is just kind of batshit crazy. Just go yeah. back, go back a couple of years and you're like, wait, really? <laughs> yeah. So now imagine magical gold. Bitcoin is digital gold. It's strong or fast, strong. It's magical gold. So, so what does that mean? Well, a hundred million dollars of gold weighs about 3000 pounds. I can dematerialize it to no weight in Bitcoin. To take 3,000 pounds of gold from New York to Tokyo would cost you $250,000 by the time you paid for the jet, the security, the insurance. And it would require you um, a week, 100 hours, right? To move $100 million of Bitcoin from New York to Tokyo with physical delivery on the blockchain would cost you five bucks transaction fee, and it would take you, what, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, depending upon how many confirmations you want. Call yeah. it an 60 hour. 60 minutes if you pay a dollar, you know, 20 minutes if you pay five. <laughs> so there you go. 20 minutes versus one week. Is it faster? It's faster. Is it smarter? Well, you know, I put the, I put the gold in a vault. It sits there for seven years. It's a dumb rock. It's a, it's a, it's a dumb rock. There's no software in it. I, I wrap a piece of software around Bitcoin. I go to sleep. The software scans a thousand exchanges. It looks at a hundred thousand counterparties. It figures out who wants to give me the most for the Bitcoin if I lend it to them or if I, or if I don't lend it to them. It chops it into a thousand pieces. It zips it back and forth at the speed of light. Because By the way, you can do this all off chain. You don't have to do it on chain. Right, you can do at the point that I made the other day is when we traded Bitcoin, we did 88,000 off chain transactions to do 18 on chain transactions. So, so you can do this stuff at the speed of, of light and you can do 100,000 transactions an hour. The goal yeah, is still yeah. sitting there. Is it smarter? Yeah, I can turn on a piece of software that'll run for the next hundred years that'll always be thinking about how to do what I want it to do. And, and the mobile wave, I describe uh, digital money. What if I, what if I want to actually endow, uh, maybe, maybe I got a family, so I create a trust and the trust is in Bitcoin wrapped in a piece of software. When my daughter turns 18, she gets some money. Every year thereafter, she gets more money, you know? Yeah. And, and the crazy and thing is you can do that without a counterparty. Like you can just write that into Bitcoin. So smarter? faster and stronger the stronger part is is try to walk down the street in istanbul on a saturday afternoon at 4 p.m and liquidate 100 million dollars of gold sitting in a vault in new york city <laughs> what, what do you think your haircut would be on that like do you think you could even do you think you could actually liquidate it for a 90 percent discount yeah, yeah. i don't like, even I don't somebody think, in istanbul, like in that span no no, no, no can't, can't be done I, can, I could be standing in Istanbul, right, with my mobile phone with $100 million of Bitcoin. And I trade the stuff, guys. So I can tell you, if you wanted to dump $100 million on a Saturday afternoon, you could do it with a 3% or 4% haircut, and you would get $95 million in cash in any currency of your choice in 60 minutes. But if you had a bit more patience 
and you took three hours, you could do it with no haircut. Okay, so stronger? Yeah, it's, it's stronger for a lot of reasons. I can liquidate it any time, any minute of the day. I can, I can prove I've got it. It gets audited every 10 minutes, right? I can give you the ability, to, I can prove to you I own it, and you can check it every 18 seconds. And I can simultaneously do that with a thousand counterparties a year with mm -hmm. a computer controlling the counterparties on a decentralized network. Now tell me how gold's going to do that. Speaking of proof, I got a question. Do you guys run a node? I I, I can't talk okay. about exactly how we handle our crypto and what we do. I'd like to, but it's just uh, my security team would, they would spank me. <laughs> I have no I, oh, I, we'll skip all over that. I, I had about 50 talk, questions about it. So. <laughs> maybe we'll talk more about how we handle that stuff, but I just can't. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. We'll so, leave that, uh, we'll leave that make, on the table then. I want to make that last point about elemental, you know, paradigm shifts driven by elemental inventions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, uh, look at the history of uh, architecture, civil engineering. You build your houses with wood. They're two stories. You build your houses with masonry, they're five stories. When we invented steel, we built 100-story houses. Yeah. Steel is elemental to civil engineering. It's almost the perfect material. Take it away, the entire civil, all, all of modern architecture collapses, all of it. That's why Andrew Carnegie mattered. Now, let's go to the next thing, aluminum. You ever try to build a steel airplane? They don't fly. <laughs> can't be done. Yeah. If we didn't invent aluminum, there would be no aviation industry. It is literally that simple. Take the aluminum away, it doesn't fly. There's nothing, nothing at all. Now go to oil. Before John D. Rockefeller, we're burning kerosene, you know, at best. We're, we're like chasing around the world. Either that or whale oil. oil. <laughs> whale oil. Okay. John D. Rockefeller harnesses not just crude oil, but the distribution network and he drives down the price of energy by a factor of a thousand, you know, a, ma a factor of a thousand, you know, like yeah, that's crazy. 10 cents a kilowatt hour. The world, you know, cheap free energy is, is the bedrock of civilization. Now, Bitcoin, what is, what is the finance industry based on? It's based upon like uh, one year old representations. My accountant fills out a personal financial statement as of December 31st, 2019, I hand it to a bank four months later and they decide whether they want to do business with me. That's too slow. The reason yeah. that, look, the reason that, that uh, our announcement had credibility is because publicly traded companies have armies of accountants and lawyers that look over everything that I say. And if I lie to you, it's a criminal offense and I go to jail. Yeah. Not just that. If a person that works for a person that works for a person lies about something and I endorse it, I might still be criminally liable. Okay, so, so the credibility of a CFO and the CEO of a publicly traded company in America on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange is the highest credibility of any statement anybody on earth can make because, because not only am I criminally liable and I've got a set of regulators, I have an army of people around me and it ripples down and they become reliable. So I can't yeah. do it without all my directors, all my officers, all my outside counsel, all my auditors being aligned. And that is the price. That's, and that's why public companies can issue equity and debt, right? Yeah. But guy, if, if instead of that, a company said to you, we're, gonna, we're going to transparently, uh, we're gonna transparently share our, you know, our uh, public key, and this is our crypto or, and, or we're going to put it in a, we're going to put in a multi-sig relationship. And if you could verify the $1 billion worth of crypto, a private company had or yeah. an individual had at that point, you don't rely upon 3,500 publicly traded companies to trust about they, every three months. I tell you my balance sheet every mm -hmm. three months. And then if it changes yeah, materially, we have to report in two, three, four business days. Mm -hmm. But imagine a world where any private individual can t report to you within 10 minutes. 
Just yeah, you're going it, from verifiable proof, not even like a maybe the accountants got it wrong or like what's the what's the difference? Like you can straight up sign and know 100% without question. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely so insane. In that way, crypto gold is the bedrock of of a modern a 21st century economy where 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 hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of counterparties can trade and trust each other with large uh, transparent real-time certainty that that uh collateral has not been double pledged rehypothecated and there's no fraud yeah and and that changes the speed with which we do stuff it by a factor of a million yeah. and that's why you can't just say it's a little bit better than gold yeah and of course i'm not even talking about all of the paper debt you know commercial debt sovereign debt i mean that stuff's so far down below gold in terms of tangible that is you know yeah yeah that's 18, 18 layers of risk i, I know i know you but uh, i gotta leave you with one more metaphor okay you know, okay if, if uh if you're gonna actually build uh build your treasury based upon cash or or uh debt instruments mm -hmm. it's like trying to cross the atlantic in a rubber raft with a leak in it <laughs> if you're going to build your treasury on gold, it's like crossing the Atlantic in a wooden ship. It will, it will work the for, fine for a year or two, but for a hundred years back and forth, the wooden ship is eventually going to spring a leak. Yeah. If you want to cross the Atlantic in, in Bitcoin, it's like a thousand foot long steel hauled freighter. <laughs> you choose what you want to use. Okay, that's awesome. I gotta run, guy. I mean, Dude, I'm going. To I know you. We 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 crossed your your limit here. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Um, again, uh, major kudos to the uh, conviction you have on this, and basically the precedent you set here. Um, so uh, it's it's awesome talking to you. If we hopefully get a chance to do this again, I know I've got a million questions I could bug you with. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, man. Take it easy.